what for the introduction and because in this kind of events that are very interesting spaces for discussion. So yeah, I would like just to share some preliminary research about my PhD. Since I'm a second year PhD student registered here at the University of Otago, and I'm working in information science and I go in some pain working with AI and representative technology. So as you already mentioned, uh, AI is a very big problem, not just from the world, but also particularly from New Zealand, because almost uh, 44% of the emissions is coming from the livestock industry. At the same time, methane is a very powerful gas in terms of global warming potential, but also uh, because of the shorter uh, lifetime, the, the intervention can be seen in the near future in contrast with the CO2 intervention that takes uh, hundreds of years. So that's why uh, after the time would be a very effective option to mitigate climate change. Also, it's a great opportunity to study uh, in New Zealand because it is not just an isolated island, but at the same time, almost all the methane is emissions coming from one source that is the livestock industry. So, currently, there are some methods to measure or to estimate the methane emissions in New Zealand, and then there are basic mainly uh, from theory. So there are some theoretical estimations, and this is the method that the New Zealand government is using. It's a, called a bottom-up approach. So it is basically to extrapolate some local measurements into uh, bigger areas, but it has uh, several problems because, yeah, the different conditions for life so depends on the feed, depends on the the weather depends on several variables that is not taken into account by these models. Also, uh, this is the way that the government is measuring the mitigation efforts. So, New Zealand is investing a huge amount of money in mitigating the emissions. They are developing, even though passive things for the animals, they are developing new feeds and new management strategies to try to mitigate climate change. But if you measure it using just uh, theoretical estimations, uh, there is no way to, to really understand what is happening if you don't have a, a very optimized method to, to measure the effectiveness of, of those uh, interventions. So currently there are some methods to, to, to measure or to verify the effectiveness of this strategies. Uh, this is uh, one called uh, example of side seat, something like that. Uh, and basically it's a closed chamber attached to the nose of the animals and they are measuring what is the methanic change. Later they call example can be from the labs and so on. So it is very invasive to the animals. Also there are another kind of Closed chamber thermometer that is liquid. So, this is uh, some sensors and the animals going uh, to take food and also is measuring the, the methane in this kind of fluids. There are another kind of methodology that are called the uh, micro methodological techniques. So, this is called an ethical variance tower. So, it has a very expensive equipment attached here. And they basically measure what is the change of methane or the movement of methane through the air. But we can say that this, uh, this technique is very expensive. We are talking that one of these towers can cost up to 100k US dollars. So you cannot, be, you cannot, I mean, you cannot have too much towers spread in the concrete, or you cannot move it if we think that the the livestock herd is just change from one pallet to other. And also there is uh, some new methods that are aircraft based, but it has some, uh, they need a uh, consequence, uh, a 
and that's how they can just capture a snapshot of time. So that's why we think that satellites can be a, a, a very nice tool to, to avoid these kind of these methodologies. So, so yeah, we have a quite new satellite that was launched in 2018 that is Sentinel-5, hosted by the European Space Agency. So this is a spectrometer that is measuring daily the chemical composition of the, of the atmosphere and a quite reasonable resolution of almost five kilometers. So after applying some uh, methodologies to the cloud machinery, uh, we can assess different trade gases and one of the products, one of the main products is that's why we are thinking to use this uh, data zone. And here we started to, to see some, um, particularly we can find very nice correlation with the image that we saw previously. So this is the average from 2019 and 2022 of the methane concentration in the atmosphere. So you can see here some hot spots in this is uh, in, in South in Canterbury and at the same time in the north in Wellington. In particular, these are the areas uh, traditionally uh, with high density of likes of production. So the first thing that we did was was like a, just see what was the, the tendency to the different regions of New Zealand and see uh, if they were on the stand in the different years. Next week. Oh, it's working now. And after that, we try to correlate this with the official estimate from the Google. So we got a pretty nice correlation. So here we have the estimation from the average estimation from Sentinel 5, and here we have the estimation from the Stats New Zealand. And yeah, it was pretty clear the correlation also between the different years. You can see that in some years we have more emissions, but yeah, this, this correlation is, is quite clear. The second thing that we did is just integrating the black cover data. So we use the LANC research, LANC cover data included by LANC research. Uh, the only thing that we did is just extract by the different LANC covers what is the, we aggregate by LANC cover the, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. And that's it. And here, yeah, I was trying to find like a High producing exotic grassland that is typically where the animals are migrating. Uh, this uh, takes the, the majority of the emissions. The second thing that we did is uh, once the spatial pattern was quite uh, validated, we would like to see in terms of the temporal uh, axis. How was the, the behavior? So we took data from uh, a research station from Niwa that is in Laura in Central Otago. So this is one of the one of the chemical factories. Another one. Yeah. So this uh, this is a research facility, one of the most important research facilities in the world. So basically, they are collecting. Uh, information about the chemical composition in the atmosphere and um, yeah, Lauder has a very special uh, characteristics in terms of the, the look at most clouds in the year and the air is so clear so it's a very 
a special place to collect these samples that have lasers and spectrometers and different very uh, nice equipment for that. So we took some uh, some of their data. So here in blue we have the the time series of the Sentinel five. And we compare the time series with the time series of the T conduit. This is a, some kind of a network of based on Fourier spectrometers. So this is uh, this is considered the gold standard to measure concentration in the atmosphere. And yeah, it's clear that both uh, signals are quite similar. And also, we compare them with uh, another data collected just in the, in the surface. Yeah, so here we can see the difference to measure a uh, column of air between the surface and the top of the atmosphere compared with just collecting the samples in the surface that probably have more concentration. Not, uh, not diffusion. But we can start also thinking in some of the limitation of satellites. And here, for instance, if, you, if we just think we are seeing local minimums in January, and this is not expected because in some areas we will expect more emissions because the animals are feeding uh, more. But this is not the case. And this associated with the physicochemical process in the atmosphere as well because we have more O, more OH and OH is some kind of a diffusor of the methane it's some kind of a sink uh, but also another limitation mm -hmm. is like a, as I already mentioned it's, it's measuring all the column and since the life span is 20 years Maybe we can see even emission that was not produced in New Zealand. So uh, satellites observe the multiple methane, and this can be very uh, strongly influenced by global and regional wind uh, patterns. So we need to start thinking on, me on methodologies how to correct that, how to convert this total column into an emission source here and quantify and see where it's located. And this is a very clear example of that. So, this is the only feedlot museum, it's in Canterbury. So, they are housing almost 25,000 uh, animals, almost 20,000 animals, probably, in a very confined space of those 26. So it's expected to have a very concentrated source of emission. So we just explore uh, the region that's in Canterbury. So here we have the field up, and here we can see the methane plume. So we can see that it's not just in the in the place, but also what has shifted here. Maybe this is because of the wind patterns. So that's why we need to correct the wind. Uh, we would like to, to convert total columns into losses. So, next one, please. Yeah, so how we can correct the environmental effect. And the approach that we are exploring is using atmospheric transfer models. So, atmospheric transfer models is physical models. You can think that they model for a particle of methane that is emitted with this magnitude, and we have these winds where the, the particle is, is gone. So this model takes uh, emission priors that are basically bottom-up approaches. So it is some kind of prior knowledge that we can start thinking, OK, this is our initial distribution. We have some observations. But in the case of, of New Zealand, there are the kind of observations that NIWA is doing. And we need to say that this is a very sparse network. Uh, from this document, they were just two places in all New Zealand. So now they are increasing until to five places. But even though it's a 
that is sparse in a row. And also the wind fields. And after that, they can just have the posterior emissions that are optimized uh, to give you the run sanitative process. However, um, these APMs are not computationally, they are quite computationally expensive. These algorithms can based run. So if we would like to take real time decisions, this is not an affordable solution to go. It's mainly for research. Uh, also, this data has a lot of errors. Yeah. So the winds are coming from another model. The model itself, any model is perfect as the world is safe for some model. And the observation has some errors. Yeah, so we would like to, to create new ways to, to do the same process but in an optimized way. So, yeah, we would like to produce faster statistical models from existing to several more computationally demanded physical models. So, we would like to emulate this model through modern methodologies. And we are thinking to use uh, artificial intelligence so we can fit the artificial model to some of the data. We already have these outputs, so we can substitute this, I mean, this classical model for uh, AI. So, to do uh, some case of study, we start. Uh, Working with an uh, already produced data set, an algorithm that was building this data set can take months. But this is some uh, data set that is already delivered. Uh, it is the CAMS EEG4, provided by the European Space Agency as well. The spatial resolution is about 75 kilometers, it's a global product. The temporal coverage is from 2003 to 2020. And it has a daily uh, temporal resolution that maps up well the daily temporal resolution of Sentinel 5. So we think that, okay, it means let's try to emulate the behavior of CAMS. And we started with, uh, so this is basically how the input looks like. So here we have the total columns, and we can see this is the equivalent of the observations from. Sentinel 5, and this is the output, so this is the emission. So we can see here how they are slowly starting to increase in the north hemisphere uh, in the summer. So we can see how it's starting to increase here, and later in the winter, they just go down and it's some kind of a grid of the air. Uh, so we started to just Thinking of very basic machine learning models. So, this is we started to think about random forest. It's a very well known, a very classic algorithm. And we use it 100 trees. And we pass it to the random forest five features the, column, the total column value, the latitude, the longitude, and the, the day of the year. So we can think that we are just passing the amount of methane that we have in the atmosphere, but also where it's located and when it was collected. And yeah, we surprised we got that it's quite a lot of perfect correlations <laughs> and with our RMSC of 0 0.04. And yeah, a very good point is like we are not including any ancillary information. We are just using the image from the from the methane, but we are adding information about winds, information about the OH or other kind of uh, information that these classical models need. So it could be uh, a nice option. And here are the predictions. Of course we have some outliers, so in general terms it looks good and these are the errors, but they are very really small because the maximum value is 0 0.06. So, 
So yeah, after that, since the model was trained at pixel level, we can transfer that model into Sentinel-5. So we substitute the total column from hand, and we get the, the emissions from the Sentinel-5 P. So this is the emissions uh, for the first of March of 21. So yeah, that's, it seems like a, we can use the methodology to do not know train it with simulation, but also transfer that model into real observations. However, as I already mentioned, the models are trained at pixel level, so we are not taking information about the neighborhood and also about the temporal frequency, so we will start thinking in more modern methodologies like deep learning. So we are starting in, uh, we are starting to learn, and actually this uh, value I just got before coming here. <laughs> so this is the program that we are testing. We implemented this network that's called UNIT. So the good point about uh, deep learning is you don't need to think about features. And in features, uh, I can say, for instance, passing the latitude and longitude to the running queries. Because this network is extracting the feature by itself. This is the advantage of deep learning. You don't, you don't need to think what is the feature that better represents my model, but the, the, the network can do it by itself. So, yeah, we just trained it with uh, images from 2003 and 2018. Another point that I would like to highlight uh, we, we couldn't fit the random body with all the data because memory problems, we are having memory problems, so with deep learning we don't have this kind of uh, issue because we are passing the data in, 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 in branches of data, not just all the data. So, so that's why uh, we think that this approach would work. So I can show the, the, the images because this is still not producing, but just taking this number, we can say that we improved 0 0.03. Because the was the error in the was 0 0.04. So this model is actually improving. And we are not passing any information about in this time the latitude and longitude for the day of the year. We are just facing the uh, Feeding the network with the image, and we are getting the emission in the other side. However, yeah, I can see it before this a uh, global model, so maybe, maybe uh, the, this, this, uh, maybe the model is learning the features and patterns that are very specific to low resolution images. So also we are starting thinking. Uh, about building our own data. So we started collaborating with Niwa to create a high resolution data set. So we use Geoscan, this is something uh, that can was at 0 0.75 75 kilometers. And uh, use a mistake, uh, this model is at 25 kilometers. So if we think about it, we can see now with more detail where the emissions are coming from. At the cost of, of course, we need to build this data. So to build just this simulation, we spent two days, and we spent 200 US dollars in Amazon Web Services, because these models are so expensive. Mm -hmm. That's why this kind of challenge can help us to, to go to uh, and cover some of these uh, expenses. But luckily, uh, we already installed this uh, framework into the centers of the University of Chicago. So now we can just go without any cost and build our data, or high resolution data set, and just repeat the same exercise that we did with CAMS. And we think that training AI models from simulation can be a powerful and easy platform tool for improving missions such as MetaXAP. We already saw that uh, we pass it through 75 kilometers to 25 kilometers. So we can just create a simulation at 100 meters and just retrain the model, the AI model, easily. 
so yeah, we are collaborating with, uh, with Sarah Mikalo, she's a PI in Texas, so this is our philosophy to think that, okay, the technology is advancing, it's going to come with new uh, satellites, and year by year, the resolution is going down, but all satellites are going to have the same problem, that they are measuring the total column in front of the road, with the emission. However, within that also, maybe, maybe the simulation is not capturing the real world scenarios, so we are thinking also to fit the network with some real data. So we are going to fit the network, the human network, along with data from Fluxnet. Uh, so Fluxnet is a global initiative of edit covariance towers spread around the world. So these are the locations of the Fluxnet network. We have some uh, observation until 2018, but also uh, yeah, we are start, we are, we are starting several uh, collaborations for example, with the USDA Department of Agriculture. They, they have almost four flu towers in Arkansas, as well from the University of Waikato. Uh, they have one flu tower, and we are uh, touching several doors to get real world data so we can uh, validate and train the network with uh, real world scenarios. And yeah, at the end we like to build something uh, like this, so we can just fit a neural network with synthetic data, but as well with real-world data. And one particularity is that Sentinel-5 images are hosted in Google Earth Engine, so we can just easily uh, call the Sentinel-5 images into the Google server and retrieve the predictions, and we can create a Google Earth Engine, some kind of a dashboard in which the user can draw a polygon, establish some time frame, and we can just deliver the emissions uh, for government and stakeholders, uh, researchers that they want to, to test some mitigation strategies, or even though licensed producers that want to apply for carbon credits and so on. So, yeah, Google Earth is the final philosophy of my Thank you. Thank you.